Hello everyone, uh, I am Dr. Irpana, consultant in infectious diseases. So this will be the third lecture in the series of introduction to infectious diseases. So let's move on. So this is my profile and today we'll be discussing uh, about some interesting cases which I have come across my training in infectious diseases at PD Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai. So I would like to thank the Department of Infectious Diseases there uh, and these cases were uh, treated by them. So uh, I would also like to thank Dr. Rajesh Pandey for giving me this opportunity. So uh, coming to the first case, she is a 42-year-old lady. She is a homemaker. Uh, she had a history of decreased appetite with weight loss of around 8 to 10 kgs over 6 months. And she also had papillon nodular lesions over back face, eyelids, and oral mucosa and intermittent joint pains. So this is a sequence of events and the timeline. In June 2020, she had COVID positive. And at that time, she was uh, having pancytopenia and raised LDH and raised serum ferritin levels. And she just received supportive care at that time. And then she was transferred to another hospital after a week for the pancytopenia and was uh, evaluated there. She had hepatosplenomegaly with persistently raised ferritin levels. So after doing a bone marrow, they have given injection methylprednisolone and her bone marrow uh, examination showed hypercellular marrow with erythroid hyperplasia, megakaryocytic maturation and she was discharged after initial clinical improvement. And over the next six months, she had loss of appetite, loss of weight, odinophagia, painful deglutition, dysphonia, not able to speak properly and dysphagia to solids and the papillonodular lesions progressed and she had joint pains. And she uh, consulted different hospitals where she has received topical as well as oral steroids without any improvement. So this was the picture when she presented to us with these papillonodular umbilicated lesions over the face. And this is the oral mucosa where there were nodular lesions all over. And these were the umbilicated lower lesions over the arms. And she also has nodule in the eye. So the basic investigation showed cytopenias with hemoglobin of 5.9. Absolute lymphocyte count was still low because she had just recovered from COVID. And correlated cal corrected calcium level was very high. And serum galactamanin, uh, which we have sent, uh, considering some fungal infection was very high, that was 5.47 and anti-nuclear antibody was strongly positive. So here, uh, corrected calcium was high. So when you are treating patients, just remember that uh, if you are seeing a calcium level, you have to correct it with serum albumin and then only uh, see whether this is hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. So... CECT chest and abdomen showed an enlarged hilar lymph node and there was hepatosplenomegaly. With this background, this is a CT showing hepatosplenomegaly. So the differentials which we can consider here are one is connective tissue disease, uh, second is invasive fungal infection, third is post kala other dermal leishmaniasis and fourth was molluscum contagiosum. So when we were getting trained, the mentors used to tell us that we should make a flowchart like this, points in favor, points against for all the differential diagnosis. Here, if you can see connective tissue disease, the points in favor are joint pains, dysphagia, cytopenia, and ANA positive. But the points against connective tissue disease were the odd cutaneous lesions. Usually, we don't see such kind of uh, florid cutaneous lesions in connective tissue disease. And she was worsening despite on steroid. So second one is invasive fungal infection. What are the points in favor here? So she was on prolonged steroids uh, following COVID for these uh, point uh, during COVID and umbilicated skin lesions she had. So differentials for umbilicated skin lesions are cryptococcosis, histoplasmosis and talromycosis. And she also had mucosal involvement, anemia, cytopenia, organomegaly and positive serum galactomanin. So these points goes in favor of invasive fungal infection. But the points against was there was no lung parenchyma involvement 
and she was apparently immunocompetent. Like previously, she did not have any HIV or uh, no history of admission in the previous hospitals before this uh, presentation. And the serum cryptococcal antigen was negative. Uh, usually in disseminated cryptococcus or CNS uh, cryptococcus, the serum cryptococcal antigen is an extremely sensitive test. Uh, it, it detects CNS tuberculosis or disseminated tuberculosis even uh, before the other tests like MRI brain. So it is an it is an extremely sensitive test. So here it is negative. So uh, cryptococcus we can rule out here. And then post kala other dermal leishmaniasis. Uh, there is hepatosplenomegaly, weight loss, pancytopenia, papillonodular lesions, which goes uh, uh, in favor, but she is not from any endemic area. She was from Maharashtra only. And molluscum contagion is usually seen in HIV positive patients, and it is a chronic localized infection without any systemic involvement. Mm, and it contains painless umbilicated skin nodules. It can cause conjunctival oral mucosal involvement rarely. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> The skin biopsy of the umbilicated lesion here has showed histopathology compatible with histoplasmosis. So prior to biopsy, we have sent the earlier bone marrow uh, biopsy report and the slides for review. And they have done the fungal stain where it was studded with histoplasma. And the cultures which we have sent from the skin biopsy, it also has grown histoplasma capsidatum. So the learning point here is that whenever we have some slides or reports uh, from previous hospital, we should not always take them for granted because the previous bone marrow report showed just hypercellular bone marrow. They might not have done the fungal staining, but whenever you are suspecting something like this, you have to communicate to the pathology or the microbiology lab and try to give them a clinical context so that they will look into it. If they don't know that there is infection, they will not be doing the fungal stains also. So here we have suspected this, so we have asked them to do the fungal stain and it showed histoplasma. So uh, always try to get the slides reviewed uh, for the second opinion. So here, this is the each cell, so histoplasma and this is a lactophenol cotton blue mount where you can see tuberculate macroconidia. These are the small, small tubercles which you can see. So this is a tuberculate macroconidia which we can see in histoplasmosis. So she has received injection liposomal amphotericin B for two weeks, uh, which is a drug of choice initially for systemic uh, histoplasma and disseminated histoplasmosis and then followed by oral hydroconazole. So for initial two weeks, she received uh, liposomal amphotericin B and her uh, odinophagia and dysphagia both have improved. Cutaneous and oral lesions have also improved. Two weeks later, then again, she started developing new lesions over the neck and oral mucosa. And the repeat serum galactamine was high. Uh, earlier it was five and now it was seven. And by opinion, she has developed again severe anemia and leukopenia. So we were treating her with liposomal amphotericin B. So uh, immediately we did not expect that the disease has worsened. Uh, so we thought it could be a paradoxical response with worsening clinical status. And hence, dexamethasone was started. Steroids have been started. So liposome initial, there was initial improvement followed by worsening which, which fits into the paradoxical response. So liposomal amphotericin B, we have continued for another two weeks and she was discharged on itraconazole and tapering dose of oral steroids. So after follow-up, after two weeks, again, there were new lesions over face and neck while steroids were being tapered, which fits into the paradoxical response. And also, she could not achieve therapeutic levels of itraconazole despite increasing the dose. See here how important is therapeutic drug monitoring or TDM, which we have discussed in the last lecture. Here, it is not that you have you have started itraconazole and stopped following up, but we have to monitor the itraconazole levels, which were in this case very, very, very low, less than 0 
oral hydroconazole has very less bioavailability compared to the suspension but suspension is uh, not easily available in india so the dosing of steroids was increased for paradoxical response and posaconazole was started because hydroconazole levels were not being achieved so she has responded very well till next follow up but she has developed an eyelid nodule which subsided when the dose of steroids was further increased and the lesions over mucosa and rest of the body have completely subsided so this was before treatment and this was after treatment so these nodular lesions have almost uh, faded away so again the recent development was that she has developed this redness in the palpebral conjunctiva and burning sensation and at the time posaconazole levels were within range 1.3 so uh, the dosing of steroids was increased considering this is a paradoxical response only and topical voriconazole was started along with topical steroid so few months later she has severe edema pedal edema and facial edema there was this nodule uh, so what is the reason for this extensive edema or puffiness of face one is steroid but steroid doesn't cause this much of edema so the mechanism here is that posaconazole inhibits 11 beta hydroxy dehydrogenase which is an enzyme which converts cortisol into cortisone so when this enzyme is inhibited by posaconazole there is increase in the mineralocorticoids and it causes pseudo hyperaldosteronism and there will be hypertension hypokalemia and sometimes the patient will land into congestive heart failure when you are giving the posaconazole for prolonged periods so always you have to have the patient under follow up and monitor the potassium levels and monitor all these things and this uh, uh, we can give diuretics for this and we can use pyrenolactone so because it is a potassium sparing diuretic and the patient will slowly improve but we may have to uh, see whether the uh, levels have increased over the board and try to decrease the dose or maybe sometimes we need to stop if the patient is having severe heart failure <clears throat> so that's what that was the first case and the second case is breakthrough fungal infection in an immunocompromised patient with severe covid-19 patient so these are all cases during peak covid so this is a 17 year old male with extra medullary granulocytic sarcoma and he was started on it, it behaves like aml so he was started on induction chemotherapy with danorubicin plus cytarabine and antimicrobial prophylaxis was started because of the same reason that it behaves like aml and he was on induction chemotherapy which will cause neutropenia so and he was started on antimicrobial prophylaxis with posaconazole gr is gastro resistant tablet and also acyclovir so he developed febrile neutropenia which was expected and during that period she had carbapenem resistant klebsiella pneumonia bacteremia and was treated with ceftazidime avivactam and then a few days later he had dry cough and tachypnea with bilateral infiltrates on chest x ray so as obviously expected it was the peak covid period and nasopharyngeal swab for sars cov2 was positive and then he had to be shifted to covid icu he was requiring very high flow oxygen and remdesivir was steroids were started and multiple granulos and platelet transfusions were administered for prolonged cytopenia so prophylactic posaconazole gr tablet was switched to amphotericin b because his serial ecg showed prolonged qtc which uh, is due to posaconazole so liposomal amphotericin b 3 mg per kg body weight we were giving daily his electrolytes were within range and no other qtc prolonging agents were used so oddly just before stopping Uh, we used to routinely monitor therapeutic drug levels. So after starting posaconazole, we have set the level. It was sub therapeutic. So one week later, anyway, he was shifted to liposomal amphotericin. So we did not do anything. And then one week later, while still severely neutropenic, he developed high grade fever, 
multiple erythematous tender, extremely tender that the patient was not allowing us to touch even for examination. Multiple tender, non-pruritic nodules on both extremities, trunk and face along with bilateral leg pain. So here the differentials for skin nodules would be one is candidemia, second one is disseminated mold infection, erythema nodosum, usually seen in non-neutropenics, even normal patients all as well for TB and sarcoid, and nocardiosis, which is a bacterial infection in neutropenics and immunosuppressed. But his skin biopsy was inconclusive at that point of time. And serum beta diblocan, which is a pan fungal marker, it was also indeterminate, 82. And serum galactamine was also negative at that time. It's 15 so hours. Here, skin biopsy did not give anything, and fungal markers also did not give anything conclusive. And the blood cultures grew CR E. coli, NDM, for which appropriate antibodies were again restarted. But E. coli doesn't cause this type of nodules. No? So the skin nodules darkened with time. Then what happened with neutrophil recovery as day plus 35 following induction is a prolonged period. So the patient developed redness in the right eye followed by reduced vision and epiphora, watering and pain. And CRP levels have increased sharply and repeat BDG showed an increase to 206. So earlier it was negative, now it has increased. So, uh, ophthal opinion was sought and examination showed a clear cornea with circumcorneal congestion and differentials included were anterior uveitis, endophthalmitis, CMV retinitis. So, CMV level was sent, plasma CMV viral load was undetectable and vitreous aspirate grew, fusarium solani complex. Okay. So, this is a septate fungal uh, fungus. It comes under mold. So white powdery fusarium colonies and calcofloor stain, which we have seen in our previous lecture as well. Here, these are septed fungi. Here you can see the septa, septed fungal filaments. And this is a lactophenol cotton blue mount where you can see banana shaped macroconidia. This is like fusiform shape. That's why this is called fusarium. And these are the fungal hyphae with septa in between. Okay. So, systemic as well as local intravitreal oriconazole therapy was started because this is a septate fungus. Oriconazole ref levels were monitored. And liposomal amphotericin B, we have increased the dose to 5 mg per kg per day as a part of combination therapy because this is a profoundly neutropenic patient with disseminated physiosis because you have seen fungal nodules and the patient also has eye involvement. So the combination therapy was given because some species of fusarium respond to voriconazole, some to uh, amphotericin B. So initially, we did not get the sensitivity report, so we have given both. So he required a vitrectomy and lensectomy and his clinical course was complicated by frequent episodes of dyselectrolytemia because even liposomal amphotericin B and postoconazole both cause hypokalemia. And he also had one episode of torsades, which is polymorphic ventricular tachycardia because of the dyselectrolytemia. However, an attempt to reduce the dose of liposomal amphotericin B from 5 to even 3 mg per case body weight at day 21 of therapy was met with new vitreal infiltrates. So we could not even decrease the dose of liposomal AMFO. So despite repeated intravitreal antifungal installations, aggressive attempts to continue an optimal antifungal regimen, we have done everything, local therapy, systemic therapy, dual antifungals, close electrolyte monitoring, but he lost his vision in the affected eye and he has developed thysis bulbi. So at least we are continuing the treatment because uh, we have to prevent the spread to another eye and we have to prevent it from going into the brain. So a relentless 49-day stay in COVID isolation unit because, you know, neutropenic patients and immunosuppressed patients, their COVID uh, comes positive for like long, long periods for even two to three months. So we can't shift them out of the isolation ward, which will lead to this severe depression because they, they can't meet their 
family members and that was the peak covid period in 2020-21 so after six weeks of combination treatment he was continued on tablet voriconazole alone mm, he uh, remained stable but the thing was that his repeat pet ct after three months showed again recurrence of sarcoma and he was shifted to another hospital and lost to follow up so this case is basically highlights the entity of breakthrough fungal infection in this vulnerable subset of patient malignancy and covid 19 so what is the definition of breakthrough fungal infection that is any invasive fungal infection occurring during exposure to an antifungal including fungi outside the spectrum of activity of an antifungal suppose you are giving voriconazole prophylaxis so during exposure to an antifungal drug including fungi outside the spectrum of activity of an antifungal that means if suppose patient has developed mucormycosis voriconazole does not cover mucormycosis but you can call it breakthrough fungal infection because the definition includes fungi outside the spectrum of activity also not only within the spectrum of activity of the prophylactic antifungal which we are giving to the patient. So here, why does breakthrough fungal infection happen even if the patient is already on antifungal? That is because of inadequate drug levels. Like here we can see that the patient was already in posaconazole, but you remember that he was having sub-therapeutic posaconazole levels. That is why TDM is very important. All due to organisms that are not covered by the prescribed antifungals. So, TDM depends on several factors. Like, if the patient is not able to achieve levels, first we have to look for compliance. Whether the patient is compliant with the treatment, is he taking the treatment properly? And second is drug drug interactions, food interactions, uh, bioavailability of the drug, all these things. <clears throat> so, our patient may have developed fusariasis at that time when the postoperative levels were subtherapeutic. It is likely that the infection was suppressed but not eradicated by liposomal amphotericin B, and he developed a classical paradoxical exacerbation with neutrophil recovery. So you remember initially he only had fungal nodules, but after that, during neutrophil recovery, he had infiltrates because again, if the patient is neutrophilic, there is no pus. Uh, to form so we don't see any infiltrates or abscesses in neutropenic patient but during recovery of neutropenia suddenly whatever infection is there in the body it gets flared up and then we get pus formation and suddenly fever and worsening uh, clinically and both liposomal amphotericin B as well as oriconazole have been used successfully as monotherapy for invasive aspergillosis but recent data revealed a trend towards better clinical outcome with oriconazole so that's, that was the second case. These are few pictures which I have kept just for you. So this is a, a patient with conjunctival congestion and edema of the uh, periorbital uh, edema. So when he came, he was uh, it was a peak COVID period and he was wearing a mask and we were wondering what this could be. There is one vesiculobulous lesion here and eye uh, involvement. So when we have asked him to remove the mask, we have found this lesion. So basically this is a herpes zoster ophthalmicus with involvement of one half of this area and he has responded to acyclovir. And this was again a case of herpes zoster ophthalmicus but because of the secondary bacterial infection, it was misdiagnosed as cellulitis and he was on uh, antibiotics. But you can see that there is uh, no involvement on the other side. You can see the midline and involvement of right half of the face. He has also improved with uh, antivirals. You can see the healing phase. And one more, he is an immunocompetent dentist with severe like vesiculobulous lesions all over the neck and the face, cervicothoracic involvement. So these are the healing phase after treatment. These are healed lesions. 
So coming to the last and final case, I think third case. So this is a 73 year old female. This was also during COVID. She doesn't have any comorbidities. Uh, she, there was no history of driving outside Pune. She was from Pune. She was vaccinated with COVID shield, second dose. And she presented with fever, body aches on 16th. And then shortness of breath on 19th. So fever followed by shortness of breath within three months, three days. And she was admitted elsewhere. She was irritable, tachypneic on 15 liters oxygen. They said history of husband died recently. So some, I don't know why, but something clicked at that time. Husband died recently and she has all these things, fever, dry cough. So in the background, I was thinking, does this patient is HIV positive? Because husband also died recently, but she is 73 years old. So it could be anything. So this is a chest X-ray at that point of time. So they were perihelar shadows and there was no involvement of the periphery, which again goes in favor of PCP pneumonia. Because if you're in dry cough without any sputum and severe shortness of breath in just two, two days. So in view of chest X-ray suggestion of peripheral sparing with acute shortness of breath, HIV, LDH and beta D glucan were sent. So because we were suspecting PCP, we have sent HIV, LDH again for PCP and BDG for PCP because it is extremely sensitive and LDH, LDH will be high in PCP and HIV. HRCT chest was advised and COVID-19 was also sent because it was the peak COVID period. So what is the difference between PCP infiltrates and COVID infiltrates? How do you differentiate? Usually, <clears throat> you know, COVID-19 causes peripheral infiltrates involvement of the periphery, but PCP usually spares the peripheral and there will be mostly perihilar shadows without uh, involvement of periphery. So LDH was 717, which was very high. And uh, other viral um, uh, antibodies were sent because uh, to rule out viral kind of ARDS, dengue, Chikungunya, Leptospira, Malaria, all were negative. Urine was normal. Biofire, upper respiratory panel was negative. Lower respiratory panel was negative. You see, HIV-1 was positive. So on further probing, attendants accepted the husband died of HIV. Initially, they said he has died of some heart issue. But ultimately, they have accepted that he was HIV positive. But she was negative and tested. So the impression here is pneumocystis aduichi pneumonia. He was, she was treated with Bactrim, this TMP SMS, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, and steroid because she was requiring high oxygen requirement and extensive lung infiltrate. So each and every patient of PCP need not be treated with steroids. But the indication is that if the PAO2, partial pressure of oxygen is less than 70 millimeters of mercury or the PAO2, uh, AA gradient, alveolar or arterial alveolar gradient is more than 35 mm of Hg, then you have to give steroids also. The dose of steroid in PCP is 40 mg of prednisolone, twice daily for initial 5 days, then once daily for initial 5 days, and then 20 mg once daily for 11 days. Total 21 days of TMP SMX plus steroid. <clears throat> So yeah, as you can see on 20th, she, when she presented, the chest x-ray was like this. And after steroids and septron, the chest x-ray, yes, there was clearing in the chest x-ray. And CRP has decreased, O2 requirement decreased from 15 to 8 liters in 3 days. But she was very irritable, not communicating properly. So she is a HIV positive patient. We did not get the CD4 count at that point of time. But the basic investigations which we need to send for an uh, HIV positive patient is along with HIV, we have to see whether the patient is having hepatitis B, hepatitis C, toxoplasma, antibody, we can just do and keep it aside or uh, serum cryptococcal antigen, liver function, kidney function test, VDRL and syphilis. So in this, we have sent all these things and serum CRAB also we have sent because in HIV patients with uh, CD4 count less than 100 or 50, 
the cryptococcus gets reactivated and the easiest way to uh, see whether the patient is having cryptococcus or not is serum cryptococcal antigen. We can't do each and every patient, we can't do MRI. So initially we can do serum crack and see if it is positive. If it is positive, we have to do MRI brain even if the patient is uh, like uh, not having any symptoms of CNS uh, cryptococcus. You have to see uh, MRI brain and see whether there is any involvement of the meninges or the brain. If there is no involvement, then you can just give fluconazole. But if there is an involvement of the brain, then you have to give liposomal amphotericin B as indicated for cryptococcus and treat him like cryptococcus. So this is an extremely sensitive test as we have discussed and it can be easily diagnosed with lateral flow SITs like a pregnancy, urine pregnancy test kit. You can keep it in your hospital for serum crack as well as urine histoplasma antigen also. And this is, is two tests are very useful for the these kind of patients. So here, serum crack turned out to be positive and CD4 count was very less. So attendants were explained about the possibility of cryptococcal meningitis because of her sensorium and she was not responding properly. And the need for MRI brain and CSF analysis to see uh, the counts and the CSF, pre CSF pressure and all these things and confirm cryptococcus. CSF cryptococcal antigen we have to do. Uh, because it gives a prognosis also. So CT abdomen was planned to rule out TB in view of iliopolic thickening in the ultrasound. So the issue here is that if the patient is having cryptococcal meningitis, then we have to give liposomal amphotericin B plus 5 flu cytosine. But here we are giving the patient TMP SMA for PCP. If you are giving flu cytosin also, then both are immunosuppressants. And amphotericin B also causes sometimes bone marrow suppression. So we are giving three agents for bone marrow suppression, which can cause uh, pancytopenia. So that was an issue which was expected, but in view of advanced age and need for further investigation and diagnosis of HIV, patients to uh, leave against medical advice. So this is again the image of one patient during COVID. She has rhinoorbital mucormycosis. As you can see, there's periorbital edema. And this was the conjunctival congestion. <clears throat> so during COVID, most of the patients had these kind of involvement of the uh, palate with fistula formation and nasal regurgitation of fluids, not able to talk properly, dysphonia, involvement of the upper jaw with loss of uh, teeth. Initially, pre-COVID uh, mucormycosis due to diabetes mellitus, these kind of symptoms were not there predominantly, but during COVID, most of the patients had this upper jaw involvement, losing teeth, and ultimately, because they need extensive source control uh, to prevent them from dying. So extensive source control involved maxillectomy, and ultimately, one half of the jaw used to be removed. So these are the worst cases during COVID period. This was also one young male with the uh, exaggeration of the eye because of mucormycosis. So this is a final case. This is a 58-year-old male with severe COVID-19. He was on BiPAP. Saturations were very low on roommate. He received methylprednisolone 125 TDS because at that time there was no recovery trial and everyone used to use uh, dosing uh, indiscriminately. So he was found to have a WBC count of 3.5 lakhs. So at that time, he was thought to have some lymphoproliferative disorder. He was in COVID ICU. And one month later, he had developed sudden onset hemiparesis, aphasia and drowsiness. CT followed by MRI brain was done. <clears throat> so this was the CT. This is the MRI brain in May. <clears throat> where there is a hemorrhagic lesion in the left half of the brain with midline shift. So this is MRI angiography showing the hemorrhagic lesion around 6.4 into 3.2 centimeter hemorrhagic lesion left front operator low perilational edema and midline shift. So in, more, in view of MRI brain suggestion of hemorrhagic lesion neoplastic etiology was considered PET CT was done. This is a PET CT showing the hemorrhagic lesion 
and also he had right uh, lung opacity in the middle lobe and this was showing up increased uptake and also left upper lobe involvement and mediastinal lymph node involvement so because the pet ct was showing all these lesions so here you can see the report where they have report metabolically active soft tissue in middle lesion of right lung suspicious for neoplastic etiology okay metabolically active mediastinal bilateral hilar lymph nodes likely metastatic metastatic meta everywhere they have written metastatic and but lung biopsy because they were saying they were metastatic they have sent histopathology only histopathology no microbiological test was sent only hp was sent so in hp it turned out to be fungal infection presence of fungal hype seen as narrow septate forms amidst the inflammation so we don't have any microbiological test we don't have the culture so we just have the histopathology here so <clears throat> patient was started in oriconazole after sending the uh, galactomannan and depending on the septate fungal filaments so patient and was given the option of brain biopsy because we don't know okay we have septate hyper hyper in the lung nodule but we don't know what is there in the brain sometimes immunosuppressed patients can have dual pathologies also so we need to rule out by doing tissue diagnosis we don't know whether there is malignancy in the brain but he went uh, in a discharge but on follow up we were following him up in opd on oriconazole the lung showed improvement so what i would like to highlight in, uh, after this case is that when you are taking a precious sample from anywhere so blood sample is easy you can take the blood sample any time but if when you are taking csa for pleural fluids and biopsies from the deepest parts then either you save the sample from some other tests or you send the other test as well here we don't know what it is we could have sent fungal culture fungal stain bacterial everything but we did not send anything whoever has sent uh so <clears throat> it is also important that we save the sample or we send the other tests also because sometimes uh, we get some uh diagnosis out of uh, silver's kind of diagnosis that we are not expecting this thing and suddenly something else is coming like some immunocompetent patient is having cryptococcus all these things happen like even if we are not suspecting so it is better to send the sample or else save the sample and then send it uh, later on <clears throat> so thank you so much uh, for your patient listening so this is the end of my series of infectious disease introduction lectures thanks everyone thank you dr rajesh pandey for giving me this opportunity